So the last couple of weeks, Ian and I have been developing a creature type. And uh, there's been a lot of debate in our comment section about if it already exists or not. Oh, okay. And, I was okay. like, where the fuck is this going? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I understand. So, okay. So when I say cowfolk, 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 you know. Okay. Like, like cows, cows, but for cows. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm picking it up. Uh, do you think, what, what is your thought on that? What do you envision? When I say cowfolk, because I have a very particular thing in mind, Ian has a very particular thing in mind, but the rest of the magic community, or at least in our comment section, seems to have a very specific third thing in mind. I'm picturing something that I've never really seen before, which, <laughs> which I think would be more like a, a merfolk, but instead of a fish human hybrid, it is a cow human hybrid. Yeah, but I have many questions like is the body <laughs> built like a centaur where it's like the human torso with like a cow body underneath yeah. it or is it yeah. more like like a a bipedal is that what it means when you're on two so, feet you're bipedal and I, like I think, you just have some cow parts and like a milk tank kind of belly. That sounds right. See, you're you're describing it the way I envision it. Which the is the second option or the yeah, centaur it, it, option? It, it sounds it sounds like I envision a cowfolk to be Otis from Barnyard. Like that okay, that is yeah, something that is a cowfolk. Like uh, and, but that that's just an actual cow though. No, but it, but but it's not that's just listen, an actual cow that stands on two legs. We could we could make him more uh human if you'd like. But I think the base skeleton, the like base okay. idea, okay. conceptually yes. speaking, yes, because okay. there's a lot of people in our comments section who have this idea that a cow folk already exists and that it's a minotaur. Um, but a minotaur is something that's specific. It's not a cow. It's a what is the thing that the minotaur is a human and a what specifically? It's a bull, which which is not a cow. Etym 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 etymologically I can't say that word Etymo um, etymologically yeah S verbally speaking <laughs> <laughs> it is functionally a male cow but yeah. bulls aren't technically cows they're like a they're like the they've branched off at some point in science haven't they like yeah. there's a reason why we don't do the running with the cows <laughs> Now, now, hold on. We don't, but could we? <laughs> no. First of all, first of all, if you've seen any videos on the internet about cows, you know that they are the dogs of the farm. And you mm. don't see the same kind of videos about bulls. So I right. would say that the minotaur is not a cow folk. Right. Also, right. the minotaur typically is a legendary creature. In mm. all things that aren't Magic the Gathering, the Minotaur is yeah. a legendary creature. That is that is rather strange when, when Magic does that. But I guess, you know, if you're creating an entire magical sphere of reality, right? Like, it's, you've got to eventually be you like, wanna keep doors look, open. They're, they're all special. I get it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. when I when I when I search it up here, bulls are very much are sp very specifically super muscular male. Cattle is what the the okay the, like super, super animal tight bros just some, some, some yes. guys. Chad cows it just says um, bad cows <laughs> then there's yes alpha cows <laughs> but <laughs> really toxic TikTok content. <laughs> Oh my god! Every time I'm on the show, we don't talk about magic. I think that's the trend. We're talking about alpha cows instead. Yep. yep. <laughs> talking about alpha cows. Uh, welcome everyone. Oh man, my voice is really fucked up. So I can't <laughs> get into the Alex Jones part. Welcome everybody back. This is the the Mind Sculptors podcast. 
Uh, I've got over here. These are my vitamins. You can buy these vitamins. <laughs> What's the equivalent of vitamins for, for, for Magic Player? Dice. Yeah, here we go. I've got these dice over here. These spike feeder dice. They're great. Uh, and I, they're not spike feeder dice. They're actually mine sculptor's dice, but they were misprinted with spike feeders on them. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It'll make sure that your stacks are in your windows. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Uh, you know, I I have more questions than I started the podcast with today, and uh, I don't think any of them need answers. You know. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They do. Science just can't answer them yet. Yeah. yeah, science can't. Science can't handle this. Well, the problem is science is controlled by the liberals, and we all know yeah, they're science no is, oh, yeah, Science true. is controlled by that the communist true. left. <laughs> oh my! Top God. ten okay. things the government doesn't want you to know. <laughs> that voice, <laughs> completely out of character. Just me, genuinely, right now. This is Caleb. Coming through the character of Callahan, even it sorry, Callahan. Just like this is this is Caleb coming out, who is just like my voice just hurts from that. Like how? Yeah, that's that's the kind of raw strength you need to be an alpha cow. Yeah. Everything hurts always, <laughs> but nothing that doesn't hurt isn't worth doing. Yep, that's what my that's what my sensei told me before. That's I exactly him in the face. what I saw a cow on TikTok say. <laughs> Unless it's change. Unless it's change. If it's change, it's bad. <laughs> Come on, Jeez. nah. So, last time I had Cam on this podcast, mm. before Ian was the co-host, and uh, we did a little switcheroo. And uh, we did a little, a little Rick roll. You might a little say. BNS bait and switch. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. And uh, I'm here to tell you all. Do not worry. We are not going to do that again. Uh, there is no, there's no funny business going on. This is a completely serious on topic. Uh, professional. We like I said last week, Alpha we are at the New like York Times. Minutes. <laughs> What'd you say? We just talked about alpha cows for 20 minutes. And yeah, you exactly. to say this a serious podcast. No, no, no. It's a very serious podcast. It's very, very, it's rigorous journalistic integrity of the Mind Sculptors podcast. And so Cam from Play to Win has joined us to come and give his thoughts on what the top 10 best decks for the month of October were. And uh, Cam, how are you doing? Welcome to I'm the show. doing great. You you called the right person if you wanted something serious. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm yes, I'm very serious. So this is going to be the most known serious as, thing I've as ever the done. The straight man of play to win for sure. Yes, I'm definitely known. <laughs> I've never never cracked a joke and I don't yeah. smile or blink. <laughs> It was it was halfway through you, that you kind of transitioned into like the intro to breaking news, the college humor bit, where you're like, "We're not allowed to smile or laugh." Like, <laughs> oh, geez, yeah. <laughs> Somebody well, wrote everything I, I'm going to say for me. I have a teleprompter <laughs> here, so Grant O'Brien wrote our scripts this week. Yeah. <laughs> if only. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, October was a wild month. Uh, there was. Uh, a bunch of major tournaments in October, mm-hmm. actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you follow me on Twitter, if you don't follow me at Callahan is here, I release a monthly uh, like deck standings where I go through and I pull the uh, stats for the month from EDH top 16, post what the results were for everybody. Uh, yep. And that is just kind of raw data to kind of help inform some of these decisions. Yeah. And so you can check that out. It's my pinned tweet. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if, I think it is also worth mentioning for this month specifically yes. um, that we have two tournaments, um, one which Cam helped organize mm-hmm. and the other one, which I was told I'm responsible for most of the attendance for uh, <laughs> being Lotus Con and the, the play to win uh, tournament. What was the official name for that Cam? Uh, it was just a tournament at our, at our LGS, Cloud City Games. Yeah. I don't think we had a name for it. Yeah, but you guys got 64 players, right? The full cap. Yeah, we we, we hit yeah. cap, which was which was great. Sick. Yeah. And so then that and uh, LotusCon, which was the largest attended DDH tournament uh, in the U.S. to date. 
but also not on EVH Top 16, although <laughs> on this podcast, you may have heard that they, they have the information ready and available. Uh, all that being said, so the EVH Top 16 data for this month is a little skewed when it comes to yep. big results because we're missing two reasonably sized tournaments on, on yep. there, which is a little interesting. Um, also, I think just the fact that the Invitational happened, I think some of those data points will be throwing some of like the things that we know off. Uh, although I know in general, we tend to filter for larger attendance tournaments. Yeah, we we uh, uh, filter uh, from the, the the statistics to make the standings, just so you are aware, uh, for those at home, is uh, the tournament size needs to be above 50. Mm -hmm. uh, for a deck to make it into it, it needs to have 10 or more entries over the course of the month. So mm -hmm. if it doesn't show up on my standings, that's not a indictment on the quality of the deck. Yeah. It's just, it's not showing up. Uh, mm -hmm. It needs to hit 10. If it can't hit, which I feel like is a really low floor, right? Um, so yes and, yes and no, right? Like, I, I think it's pretty easy to argue that the, the Mox Masters Invitational winning deck, like, probably could miss that. You know what I mean? Well, and it did. It did miss yeah. that. It, it did so not make the standings. Yeah. And so it's like, but that's also why I think it's important to when I go through and I talk about those things, I contextualize that mm -hmm. because it's yeah. very like you can see that and think, oh, well, this is this deck's garbage. Yep. But in that thread, I talk about this deck has been played four times over the past like two months. Yeah. So yeah. it's like it's not, not a lot of entries. information. Yeah, yeah exactly. it's just there's no it, there's no hard data to support that deck mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. And so without more than 10 entries, I can't right. really give you a great idea. of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is some context on there. It breaks everything down from how many games were played, mm -hmm. win, loss, draws, win percentage, all that shit. Um, but like I said, you could go over there. It's pinned tweet on Callahan is here on Twitter or mm -hmm. X, whatever the fuck it's called. Um, and uh, so whatever it is, it will give it to you. It will give it to you. <laughs> and uh, with that being said, uh, let's get into <laughs> our rankings for this month. Now, with context, our power rankings are not standings based on like performance there. We use that to help inform some of the decision making we do. But in all, a lot of this is kind of like how we feel about where things are at. And so mm -hmm. it's a lot of interpreting the data and interpreting how things are going and giving our opinion on those things. So with that being said, uh, we're going to start with our guest, Cam. And uh, do you have any honorable mentions for the month of October? I actually do have an honorable mention for the month of October. And it's actually the deck that won our Cloud City Games event. Um, okay. And that's Rocco. Rocco's yeah. a deck that I haven't been seeing as much recently, even though it's a deck that I've been playing. I haven't been playing it as much recently um and it's definitely a deck that has kind of made a comeback a little bit i want to say i know it started off really strong fell off a little bit more but it's kind of starting to see some more top 16 standings and um losing to it in the top 16 of the cloud city games event also was pretty eye-opening um mm -hmm. did you know that mm -hmm. boromir counters things if you don't spend mana on them mm -hmm. uh yeah mm -hmm. I, I i forgot about that twice during that game uh, so it's yeah. just <laughs> it's it's Lavinia. That's what it is. It's yeah, Lavinia it's that can sack itself. The real is in my local local group here, and uh, I I did have an exact situation where I was like casting early consultation, realized it wasn't going to resolve, and I was like, <laughs> all right, what if I get like I don't know a mana crypt? And they were like, oh yeah, sure, you can go get a mana crypt. And I played it, and then <laughs> taps the Boromir, and I was like, oh come on. <laughs> yeah, that don't card just has sign, kid. <laughs> that card just has sneaky text on it like that yeah, that yeah. you know i'm never gonna get got by anymore after this but um yeah. the, the deck does super well i mean <laughs> any deck that can jam like an early drenith magistrate and like be able to control the board until you put your super easy to assemble combo together mm -hmm. is super mm -hmm. appealing uh yeah. i'm lower on it now just because it doesn't have blue and i've i've missed blue more um but yeah. i i it speaks for itself and how well it performs now so yeah. Definitely like Rocco. There's just going to be more and more good cards that it's going to see over mm -hmm. time. So that's my honorable mention. I love that deck. It's a really good one. We know Michael here from uh, the Mono White Guys is a big, big, big fan of that deck. So yeah, uh, I've definitely seen my fair share of Rocco to, between yeah. him and Surreal. 
Uh, say, I, I play through a, a lot, yeah. so I, I'm very familiar <laughs> with this Procon deck. Yeah, they played uh, very Ian. well. They played very well with it. Yeah. Ian, uh, October. So in September, your honorable mention was Kirk mm-hmm. or Carrick, son of Yogmoth. What is your honorable mention this month? Well, I, uh, apparently I'm going to keep a theme of mono black decks. Uh, we're, we're talking about Varagoth, the, the Blood Sky Sire, the, uh, the oh, honorable mention for sure. They, they showed up three, three copies of basically the same deck with like one card different. Um, they took three of the top 16 of the uh, Utah tournament, which name is Salt City, I believe was yeah. that one. Salt City Rock Salt, yeah. Uh, so a top four placement and two top 16 placements from this Varagoth list. It's um it's literally just like Sadisi Fishbowl. Uh, it has a total mana value for the entire deck of 37. So you cast an Adnaz and you draw the entire deck. <laughs> it's the whole deck. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the entire mana value for the entire deck is exactly 37. I think some of them are actually at like 32. Uh, so like, yeah. <laughs> the whole point Bog is you, you, what, what are you doing? What do you mean? Yeah. You, you can get your... Come on, guys. <laughs> you can get that curve lower. Yeah. You can and do it. includes Ad Nauseam, right? Like that's like the total for the deck. So it's like yeah, Ad yeah, Nauseam yeah, yeah. and then... Mm-hmm it like brings it down by five. Yep. So the, I'm looking at the, the top four deck right now. Uh, the total mana value with ad nauseum is 36. That's crazy. So 31, 31. That's crazy. Now this was yeah. one tournament, right? Like these, this all yeah, came yeah, yeah, from yeah. one yeah. tournament, right? Yeah. 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 So I, I'm like, I, I talk with the, the TOs of this tournament a good amount. Cause I've done some coverage for their stuff before. And like, <laughs> they were like, Hey, so just, you know, these people have shown up to a bunch of these tournaments. Uh, they think this deck is the truth. For some reason, it hasn't gotten out there. But, you know, clearly the results prove that they're at least pretty good. And I'm like, yeah, fair it enough. It seems like it's a very <laughs> regional deck. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. A bunch of friends I definitely are working on it. Yeah. It, though. yeah. I, like, this is, a, this is something I would not be surprised to see, like, Alan's leave up one day and, and play on stream a bunch. <laughs> this is, it gives me, like, that energy a lot, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thinking about it like conceptually, it's really easy to set up very consistent like turn three wins with it. It's yeah. easy to get Yargoth, Var, Varagoth, what 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 is what is their name? Varagoth, Var- 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 whoever Var- they are. It's easy to get them into play on turn one. Easy to attack yeah. and boast on turn two, yeah. and then relatively easy to set up the turn three ad nauseum off mm-hmm. of like one dark ritual. Yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah. so I don't know. I think if if your table can't stop or interact with your creature attacking in three turns. You get a pretty good chance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's pretty silly. And like, it's funny, they get to play like Ornithopter and stuff like that. And you're like, okay, well, why wouldn't you just play more lands? It's like, well, no, no, no. Those sack to your calling the week, actually. Yeah. <laughs> like- <laughs> see, see what these are is these are actually rituals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, my honorable mention for mm-hmm. the month of October <laughs> is I'm, at, I'm breaking the streak. Uh, so this will be the first time since June that I have not had a, a Demir, Demir deck, deck yep. as my honorable mention. Whoa, and, uh, I'm here for history. I can't wait. Yeah, uh, My honorable <laughs> mention for this month is Malcolm Geddes. Uh, like I said, I, I have a hard time putting it in my top 10 right now uh, just because the data is like so small for it at the moment. And because of that, I'm just kind of like, Hey, it's really good. Keep your keep your eyes out on it. Uh, mm-hmm. And this is something that I think people should pick up. But until like a ton of people get their hands on yeah, it, yeah. it's really hard to say like this decks the truth when right mm-hmm. now like five people have played it. Yeah. So it's like, you know, how how good is it, is it really? Uh, all I can think of is just. Elton John is just like, hold me closer, samurai dancer. <laughs> 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 he's the only one playing the deck, but honestly, he's 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 making it look good. So yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I I have genuinely thought about sleeving that deck up because I, I mm-hmm. like I keep looking at it because I've done all of this like a lot of my job because uh, of our format change into doing power rankings has turned into mm-hmm. just constant data collection. Yeah, and so I look at deck lists like constantly. And I keep looking at this deck list over and over and over again. And I'm just like, this deck looks like it looks like it's right up my alley, like my mm-hmm. type of bullshit. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I also am just like, I want to see how it does in more general hands. Specialized pilots 
can take anything anywhere and do really well. Uh, so let's see how it goes out. Keep your eye on it. Maybe try it. Um, cause you know, it's in great colors. So who knows? I lost to it at Vegas. There was someone that played against, uh, played it against us at Vegas and I did very well. Turns out getting three Lotus petals a turn is yeah. pretty good. Mm. You would it want, it, it appears so. Yeah. Um, but with that being said, let's hop into this top 10. So, uh, mm-hmm. Cam, uh, your number 10, let, I, I'm going to go over here real quick. I'm going to go to, oh, I don't have, I do. I have Tyler's number 10. Now this is all the way back from May. Ooh. Okay. Right. Yes. Oh, this is so exciting. This is, all, this is all the way back from May. So his number 10 was Kirk, son of Yogma. Cam, this dude is what do you constantly have overvaluing I Kirk, man. I, I, that's. I, I, don't tell him I said that, but he's no, constantly no, super afraid of that deck. <laughs> I remember the one game we all played where I was like, I just played Crick and I just cracked the LED into to, to play the pier, and you were like, "I'm playing Nimrus and I have four mana open." <laughs> I, was like, I, don't, I don't know what you want from me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, he's. Um, I mean, I get it. He's a Kinnon player, and the scariest thing well, for Kinnon players is just playing really fast. So I get so, it. So I, his his <laughs> top ten in May. So this is months ago. Was yeah. Kirk at ten? Kinnon at nine, Magda at eight, Tivit at seven, Rogsai at six, Bark Sakashima at five, Thras Bruce at four, three was Nijila, two was Winota, and one was Tim Nakrom. I don't so hate that, that list. I think it's aged like milk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Some Winota has, at two yeah. is a shot. Like, uh, well, I guess right now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's um, kind of funny, yeah. But overall, uh, so your number 10, Cam. My number 10 is another deck. it's not Crick. No, it's not Crick. No, it is a monocolor deck, and it's another okay. deck that I recently took apart. Uh, mm. I have Magda at number 10. Okay. And Magda at number 10. I saw it somewhere. It made top 16 in a tournament on um, EDH top 16. Lotus yep. Mm-hmm. Lotus Con right there. And it also made top 16 at the Cloud City event. And I actually, it was my game loss in the Swiss rounds as well. Uh, me and another player on the pod kind of punted that game. And it's, I have played a ton of Magda and it's still a deck you can easily punt against because who knew they were going to get two God Pharaoh statues. That card is nuts. And the second one is just even more disgusting. Wait, um, plus, plus four to all your spells is part? Yeah. And it's only getting more tools <laughs> that we're seeing in Ixalan too. I don't want to spoil anything for your set review that's coming up later, but there's going to be some Magda cards that are coming out. So it's yes, only going to get better are. and it's still <laughs> going to be very difficult to play against this deck properly. Um, I think it still deserves some respect. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. fair. Yeah. Magda is one of those decks that uh, it's kind of like Malcolm Kettis in a way, because it, it also like th- during the month of October, like didn't see enough entries to make, the standings it actually dropped out of the standings where it saw a bunch of play in september for some reason and then october it didn't see as much play uh mm-hmm. so it kind of like fell off a little bit but yeah i magda's one of those decks i i had somebody in my lincoln uh play group who played magda a lot and i would literally sit there during our games and as soon as you would land that i was like hey we need to remove that hey we need to remove that hey we need to remove that and I know, that's people part of the reason why I ended up taking it apart. I want to have a he, fun deck to play with the commander all the time. <laughs> you have to be good at politicking when you're playing that deck because you have to be able to like in like Jedi mind trick the table into thinking you're not a problem when in fact you are very much a problem. And so it's it, that's one of the things about that deck where he'll just sit there and be like, what? what? It's just a magda. I don't have any treasures that have anything. And then the next turn he drops, you know, one door for whatever. And then the game's over. And so it's don't let it can, it can be very explosive stick around and just yeah, it went out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I will say Magda, I've never had more respect for it than I did at Lotus Con. And let me find the name of the pilot, but like the way they played it. And it was actually someone I did a, a coaching session with that week. And it was like hearing them talk about the deck. I was like, I don't think anyone's put this much thought into Magda, like period, <laughs> anyone. Yeah. Know. Uh, and then when I actually like played against them in the top 16, I was like, oh, wow, you like 
play this like I'm on a red control deck mm -hmm. and you don't overcommit and like did you just proceed to like not overcommit into the win like six, seven times. And had I because I went for it into like a lot of interaction and had I not had like six counter spells, they would have just untapped one. And I was like, I, there was literally nothing I could have done about it either. I was like, this yep. you made this deck look sick. <laughs> yeah, I think in general, like CEDH as a whole still thinks of Magda as this like turbo style deck that's just trying yeah. to jam the win really quickly. But right. all of like the best pilots have switched over. Well, I'm going to, mm -hmm. I'm going to make some people feel bad by saying that, but all, like most of the best pilots have switched mm -hmm. over to this stacks version of the deck. Yeah. That is exactly as you said, Ian, it, it plays a little bit yeah. more in the hand instead of just trying to jam out everything. It's a lot more yeah. timing based and it's a lot more strategic than just trying to jam it really yeah. quickly. So Modern um, deck that kind of makes me think of like legacy mono red prison in a way. It's like part of the reason why I love prison, it. I love yeah. mono red prison. Yeah. 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 I wish it felt closer to that for me, but I, I yeah. did. <laughs> well, yeah. I wish I could play multiple blood moons so I had a much better chance of getting like a turn uh, one blood moon or yeah, a turn one something. I, I'm right there with you, bud. I'm right there with you. And then, for the one person in the audience, it's going to be like, uh, well, we have Magus of the Moon. Yeah, it's two and a hundred. Okay. Yeah, two and a hundred. That's a lot it different. Yeah. It's not Lawrence. redundancy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Uh, so, Ian, you're number 10. Last month you had Niv Mizzet Varun. What do you have this month? Mm, yes. Well, keeping with my theme of two color control decks, let's talk about Talion, the kindly lord. Um, yes. People have been showing up Italian, doing really well with it. I think it's it's not the best deck in the format. Um, but it's a very solid blue black deck and you have a Ristic study in the command zone. So there's only genuinely so bad that can be. Uh, I see a lot of people like over committing into like the Italian game plan. And they're like, oh, I can never win games when like the people who I'm actually seeing like do really well with the deck are like, no, Italian is an engine, right? It's yeah. an engine that helps you get there. So they're playing. It's the Tivit you know, problem. Right, right. They're playing the Notion Thieves. They're playing the Shouldreds. Like they're playing things that actually end the freaking game, right? Yeah. Uh, and then they're turning the corner and controlling the hell out of the game Italian. And I think that's like <clears throat> definitely the way to go about it. I think some some pilots and players are getting it better than others. And, uh, uh, you know, second place player for all of Lotus Con was on Italian and uh, they earned nothing but respect for me in the way they were playing the yeah. game. Um, just genuinely really sick to see the deck doing well, because I, I think it's like, you know, if, if you want to like let's say like a, a good blue black deck. I, like, I'm, I'm really tired of blue black scepter outlets. Like this is a sick blue black deck, you yeah. know, like this is the blue black deck I can get behind. It is, it is an advantage engine. Like let's, let's play these controlly games. Let's name a number see what happens. You know, like that's mm -hmm. the kind of stuff I like. I've been playing a lot of Nimrus cause it's kind of the same thing. Just like a blue uh, black commander. That's yeah. also a card advantage outlet too. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. And I, I really like that direction instead of playing an outlet, <laughs> instead of getting like no advantage from my command zone. If yep. you're going to be in blue black, Italian or Nimrus are the way to go. And yeah, I think I think I just haven't caught on to how good Talion is quite mm -hmm. yet, but I yeah. have seen it draw a ton of cards and I think I'm yeah. just undervaluing I, the hell out of it. I think you, this entire like uh, current cast of this podcast is very demure heavy. Like I think yeah. I think all three of us would sleeve up Nimrus tomorrow to a tournament. Yep. <laughs> like I'm pretty sure. <laughs> if I didn't play uh, Kenrith at uh, the Cloud City event, I was definitely playing Nimrus. I feel well, that. Yeah. Ex excuse you. I I would. I I am definitely an Azorius mage before I am a Demir mage. Let's be real. Oh my god! <laughs> Come on! Come on now! Uh, well, I might I might play blue yourself. black, but I'm playing it like it's blue white. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. All yeah, right. That's yeah. fair. Uh, I also have Talion at number ten. Uh, I moved up from my honorable mention last Ooh. month. I moved it up here to ten. Uh, the one note I do think is important is it did have kind of one of the more sheepish win percentages of the month, uh, okay. right around fourteen percent, which is not great. Uh, that does also not include the uh, Lotus Con uh, data, which I do think is important because there were a couple decks there that were Italian decks that did particularly well. So I do think that does shape that narrative a little bit. Uh, but I do think it is important to point out that the win percentage on the deck is like it dropped eight spots on my standings this month. Mm. Uh, but I do think overall it's continuing to show up and it's continuing to uh, when I if I were to dig up the Lotus Con stats and compile them into this, which would 
it's just too much work. But uh, if I were to do that, it would definitely bump this up so that it's closer mm-hmm. to around a 20% win percentage, which is where I want to see a deck. That's about the average win percentage for a deck in the standings is around 20%. So like that's about mm-hmm. where I want to see a deck. Be. So yeah, uh, I like, I like where Italians at. I think it's still getting figured out. I still think people don't have exactly what the sauce is yet, but mm-hmm. I think we're getting there and I think there are people who are getting closer. Uh, and so I'm very excited to see exactly w- the more we develop this deck because I think it's a really cool archetype of deck. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, Cam, moving right along, your number nine for the month. I don't of know October. how happy I am with my number nine, but it's locked in, so it's too late okay. now. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> I have Thrasios Brews at my number nine. All right. Um, I I've historically really liked Thrasios Brews. Um, I've done I've done pretty well with Thrasios Brews before, and I think right now I just um letting my personal feelings get in the way a little bit here, but I'm putting it at number mm-hmm. nine. Uh, this color combination is still very good. I still love playing Doxide Extortionist. I think Doxide Extortionist is very good. And the builds that are more around Doxide Extortionist, I think, is um, a, a great way to go. It, it's hard to not want to play a Doxide Extortionist deck. Right. And yeah. um, when you play all the best Doxide Extortionist cards, you get Thrasios Brews. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it still makes top 16s. That's part of the reason why I don't feel bad yep. about having it here at number nine. But it's right. certainly not higher than this because of uh, well, a lot of other decks proving themselves to be a little bit better now. So, Gracios yeah. Bruise it is. Yeah, it's it's a weirdly positioned deck in the meta game right now. Um, I've been doing like <laughs> if there is one thing I am doing in my free time, it is trying to rebuild this deck from the ground up, and I've done it like six or seven times. Um, and I still haven't felt good about like just bringing it up to a tournament because I get to the point where I'm like, okay, you know, build it this way. All right, it's really good at doing X, Y, and Z thing, but let's not overcommit into this game plan because then this is just a bad Kenrith deck right and then I'll, I'll do that with a different archetype and like it, it just keeps doing that um and the the sad answer is Thrasios is just really poorly positioned right now right consistent mana engines are really poorly positioned because bowmasters and board wipes are at an all-time high right mm-hmm. so every time you're like oh yes I've developed my mana dork and then some person with heuristic studies like I'm going to keep drawing cards. You can snipe the Thrasios as much as you want. He's like, okay, cool. You know the Thrasios is the thing keeping us from losing, right? And they're like, no, nah, it's on the board though, and I have a Bowmasters here. So what else am I going to be doing? <laughs> uh, you know, as opposed to taxing the heuristic study player with their life. Um, so that's that's the pattern. We just keep seeing it, and we talked about it a lot at this podcast already. Yeah, but, I mean uh, that's why I keep recommending Shieldred to people is because Shieldred yeah. punishes heuristic study players very aggressively. Yes, Cal. <laughs> what i said that doesn't help thrasios it doesn't it also hurts thrasios actually but um i play 50 lands in my thrasios decks now so suck on that (laughs) getting around that 99 lands 99 (laughs) lands in my thrasios deck get wrecked uh no one expects valicant thrasios nobody (laughs) scapeship thrasios the new hot tech coming out of play to win (laughs) Yo, is that the way you're rebuilding it, Ian? Because that sounds yeah. like a great way to go. <laughs> you got me, man. <laughs> nice. Holy cow. Uh, Ian, uh, your number nine for the month of October. Whoa, thank you. Guys. It was last I month. Have... It was Malcolm Timna. Mm, yes, that one has moved. Uh, <laughs> I have an asterisk on this one because it involves one partner and doesn't really care what the other one is. Uh, okay. And the answer is Tavesh plus. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> something uh, something <laughs> one of them <laughs> we lost Cal <laughs> it has to be something though right like not it can't just oh, yeah, be yeah, like yeah. mono black no, yeah, yeah. okay that's actually thank you for clarifying Kim. it cannot be <laughs> nothing <laughs> the Vesh plus anything <laughs> the Vesh plus prismatic piper yeah 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 the wet sock plus the Vesh <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Uh, I'm good. But yeah, Tavesh my is, dog just came good. over to check on me. Um, <laughs> she's looking so got, at me like, "Are you okay?" <laughs> so we have Sharky, who's been doing like Krom Devesh stuff for seven thousand years, right? Um, and is like, if you look at literally Krom Devesh on EDH top sixteen, especially, it's just like their name over and over and over and over yep. and over again, right? Um, that and like one other person, and that's like 
all in well and good and like clearly they've been doing well and consistent with the deck right um but that on top of that uh they were in the invitational last weekend uh which they made top 16 and then in the cedh open there were three separate devesh decks two croms one thrasios and i was just like wow yeah this card's pretty underplayed i assume (laughs) um you know, the biggest problem with Tavesh is that, like, it's a big target that can be, like, guardianship, right? Which which does suck. And if you look at a card like Krom, obviously, it gets around that problem. Um, but the upside is, like, just a really consistent, powerful mana engine. And then, you know, if the game starts to grind out, if you ever get to that ultimate, like, the GG's. Like, there's nothing else you can do about it, right? So, it's a, it's a solid card. Does a lot of powerful stuff. So, Tavesh is my number nine spot. Tavesh. Uh, it's good number nine. I didn't know we could do singular partners. Maybe I would have. Well, put we that generally in don't. But Ian really likes to. <laughs> Ian really likes to make it up as he goes. Uh, so. they're, they're more of guidelines, you know. They're more like guidelines. <laughs> more like guidelines. <laughs> uh, my nice. number nine is uh, Malcolm Timna dropping three spots. Uh, Malcolm Timna dropped from the standings in October. It did not hit the ten deck threshold. Uh, or the 10 entry threshold. Uh, I still think that what I said last month stands pretty firmly true that it is a good and well positioned Esper deck. And yeah, that's, that's, that's how I feel about it. It just, people <laughs> didn't play it. It's like one of those decks that people will like all decide that they're going to play it at a tournament or two. Mm-hmm. And then it like spikes really hard. And yep. then it just disappears off the face of the earth for a while. Mm-hmm. And then it, all of a sudden it's back, but I, yep. I'm keeping it here at nine because it's a deck that I think is still, I like, I think it's better than Italian and it's mm-hmm. like saw enough play that I, I feel okay saying that I, I think it's in my top 10 still. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I, I think that's really fair. It's just like a mini blue farm. Yeah. yeah. Mini blue farm without red. And that's, that's really great. That's basically what Tivit is. So this is just another flavor of that. I love it. Yeah. Uh, number eight, Cam. What is your number eight? Number eight is a deck that historically play to win has not liked so much, but mm-hmm. it keeps doing really well in everyone else's hands. Um, this is a, a Traxa Grand Unifier. Mm. Um, this is a deck that uh, I don't know. I feel like we've seen do very well in tournaments, but me with my own eyeballs, haven't seen it do as much as maybe a lot of other people have seen. And I'm a it's big, a I'm a big like <laughs> seen is believing so, kind of guy. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. like when, like uh, until it spanks me a ton, like I don't respect this deck as much as maybe I should be, yeah. but from the amount of top 16s it's getting like, again, this, this is in uh, Esper plus some other really good value mm-hmm. pieces that you might yeah. want. It really is just playing a bunch of great cards. And I love food chain more than like any other card imaginable. Mm -hmm. Um, So a deck that can just like use that as a side win condition. And it it doesn't feel like it's main plan. It just feels like this Mm -hmm. little backdoor thing you can go into. Yeah. Now now I want to be clear here. Cam has called to the mind sculptors audience that Cam needs to get spanked. So you need to spank Cam for him to believe. Yes. (laughs) So here, here's something I want to address about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because I just found angry. out during Mox Masters. I did not know this uh-huh. before Mox Masters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But evidently the Atraxa like Discord server like play group mm-hmm. oh, I hates say, yeah. our podcast because <laughs> we say effectively what you just said, uh, <laughs> but also keep putting it in our top 10 month after month after month after month after month. And I, I literally, I, we were at Mox Masters and I was just like, oh, I didn't know I was living rent free in that, in their heads too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because I thought that when I was coming on here and saying that Atrax is one of the 10 best decks out of thousands, that would be a compliment. <laughs> but evidently, my critique of saying what you said is this terrible, <laughs> awful thing. And this is, oh, this is I'm not I, I've never been on their discord. They might be saying the same fucking shit about us well, over there. Here, too. Here, yeah. Here's <laughs> the thing, though, Cam, you and I share a very uh, like a large amount of opinions. And I will hear you say so, like even some things that I don't even agree with some of the most like wild shit sometimes on your podcast 
and get no pushback from the community over it. And I will say the most benign thing on our podcast. And it's like, we got to prove Cal wrong. We got to prove him wrong. Like, Cal thinks the wrong side's not the best deck in the format. I don't know. I guess I'm just never wrong and I've yet to be wrong. So I guess I think if we're looking at the data, that's what it shows. And I have exclusively right opinions. And not even you opinions. Here like, Look, just, I'm not a mathematician, but if they, <laughs> the numbers don't lie, <laughs> if it looks like a duck and it smells like a duck and it walks like a duck, I must be, I must be right. So it sounds like it tracks us spot on at number eight. <laughs> Spot on at number eight. I love it. Uh, I like this new methodology of it. If it looks like a duck and smells like a duck, I must be right. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's good. That's good. Thanks. I implied a lot of science in, behind that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ian, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah. What is your number eight? Oh, boy. So it's another part. No, I'm kidding. Uh, it's it's Tivit. Um, Tivit. All right. Yeah. Tivit has had a, quite a fall from grace, but as I felt when I was playing it in Mox Masters, like people are just, and I'm hearing this from a lot of my coaching patrons too, just like people are just treating Tivit like it's like the Antichrist. And if yep. it ever resolves, the game will end in a fiery ball of hatred. Is that not and- what happens when it resolves? <laughs> I so, grew up hearing that that's what happens when it resolves. So Ian can attest to this at Mox Masters. Yeah. I, I did this a couple of times. I think I might've said this last week, but I, I was in a situation where I had a bunch of open mana open. I was at a mm-hmm. table and uh, we're sitting there playing and they're like, well, you're going to play Tivit next turn. It was like on turn three. And I look at the table and I go, you all told me pregame, right? That you're fans of my podcast. You listen to every episode, right? And they go, yeah. And I go, when on this show have I ever advocated for windmill slamming Tivit? And they were like, oh, yeah, good point. And it's just like, I, I, I get that people are hating Tivit and that's like making it go down a little bit. But that's also like, they're also losing to other decks because of that, because they're just mm-hmm. like hyper focusing on one singular deck. Ian had this experience at, at Invitational where people mm-hmm. were just like hyper focused on that and were completely not paying attention to other actual threats at the table. And they're just yeah, like, oh, I don't know if it was like, yeah. And like uh, the part of it wasn't even just that part necessarily. Right. Like it's also the aspect of like, it's just a, a second too slow, right? Like at the highest tables in the format, right. It's just a little too slow. And that's the problem I have with it is that like, occasionally you need to turn the corner in a game and i'm talking about like i don't like tivit's in the top 10 right like it it deserves to be in the top 10 very easily right Mm -hmm. it's just when you're at those like top tables playing against really good players there's only so many opportunities you're allowed right you're you're allowed like 13 seconds worth of spell resolution basically right right and if you can't take advantage of those 13 seconds it's like oh well you lost it sorry Grand ball sure resolved. Nothing you can do about it right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, or the, the sixth counterspell fight happened and one of your opponents missequenced that counterspell fight and that's it. Sorry. And it's like that's that's the margin of error you're allowed when you're like playing at the, at the like top tables at a tournament, right? Yeah. So when Tivit can't capitalize on those 13 seconds on that minuscule opportunity, that's what just takes it from like, okay, it was number three, number two for a while, and now it's just down to like that number seven spot, right? Yeah. It's not it's not bad. By any means, still a very powerful CDH deck. Has a one card combo. Has fast historical. Has demonic constellation. Has multiple combos in it. Well, you know that because you said this there. though that the the cabal people are going to take this and run with it, and they're going to say that Tivit's the worst deck in the format now. You know, so. if they do, that's their opinion for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to change it. <laughs> Tivit at, at number eight. Uh, my number eight is Dargo Thrasios, moving up two spots. Uh, Dargo Thrasios is a deck that I think is I keep wanting to build this deck. I literally have all the cards like sitting mm-hmm. over here in a pile that I pulled and like I had like acquired like months ago and mm-hmm. I just have not put it together yet and I keep meaning to yep. but it's like one of those decks that every time I see it get played I'm always impressed by it and it had a pretty good month uh where was it like had three top 16s out of 14 entries so like a 21 percent top 16 percentage is not bad 
Uh, mm-hmm. And then also made a top four, which isn't bad. And so right around a 23% win percentage is a little bit above average. And yeah, I, I like the deck. I think it's well positioned. I think Teamer, I've said this before, that Teamer is a great, like, go burr color buy to be in. And uh, yeah, I, I just, I really like what Darker Thrasios is bringing to the board right now. So Darker Thrasios at number eight. Number seven for you, Cam. What do you got there? Number seven is a deck I'm playing right now. It's a uh, good old Kenny. Kenrith, the returned king. Okay. Um, I don't know. I really like Kenrith. It is doing the, the best of everything that you want to do. And every color, you can do whatever you want with it. That's what, part mm-hmm. of ma- that's what I think makes it really scary. Is that like when you are facing this deck, you have no idea what it can do. And it might even influence you to keep a hand that ends up being bad and not able to interact with the win condition that they actually have going on so Mm -hmm. i think the sheer velocity of things that's not the right context for that word but i'm using it (laughs) the sheer viscosity of things that you can do with kenrith i think just make this deck super well positioned at all times i love kenrith what's its oil rating cam (laughs) it's oil rating yeah because we got we got ethanol and um Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know anything else about rating oil. It's a, a great A. Great you know, great honestly, a. your lack of oil knowledge is really going to be a detriment to this podcast. Yeah, I know. So I know. I'm more really of like a up, snake yeah. oil kind of guy instead of like regular oil. <laughs> mm, I wasn't ready. Yes, snake it. oil. <laughs> mm, yes, snake will fix all. What do you guys ills. think a snake folk would look like? Uh, <laughs> wait, there's Naga. What? <laughs> That's literally oh, yeah. what a naga is. <laughs> you also have snake people on Kamigawa. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, those are the Sorry, naga. Yeah. They're, yeah. No, so they're, they're not they're naga. Camp. They're 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 specifically not nagas. Oh, you know what? Yeah, let's let's talk about this. There are snakes <laughs> in magic <laughs> and there are nagas, and they are separate things. So minotaurs and cow folk can be separate haters. All right. <laughs> there we go. It. Oh, I'm glad we got to the bottom of this. <laughs> we got it. Perfect. Nice. Um, but uh, Kenrith, yeah, yeah, I uh, I love what made me want to put Kenrith back together was actually the printing of Agatha, um, because mm, okay. for some reason the idea of using one oh, green like, mana, little, little counter, yeah, little yeah, counter, little on, counter on Agatha a couple times, so there's just one yeah. blue mana to draw a card and trigger everyone else's bowmasters for them. Mm-hmm. I don't know, mm-hmm. this is very appealing to me for some reason. Well, it, it, Kenrith is like so like it's it's worse than Thrasios when it comes to like pure card advantage right correct but what it opens up is like so many unique opportunities like i'll never forget being on cedh brazil where i had fimage and kenrith and i was able to make uh kill my fimage bring it back as a copy of kenrith in response to them targeting my kenrith with the removal spell and then flicker it again and then bring it back my real kenrith and then use my fimage to be a dock side and i was like that was all within one turn cycle and i was like, a lot of mana but it still was able to like dodge removal and have this fake Kenrith to reanimate our real Kenrith. And I was like, that's hot. Like yeah. that is the good stuff. If you, you know can push I mean? Kenrith into the late game, it can do yeah. some crazy stuff. Like one of my Insane. favorite things to set up with your Seedborn Muse is Ranger Captain and you just Ranger yep. Captain people on their upkeep every single yep. freaking turn. Mm-hmm. And it's just, yep. it's just, it's so much fun. It's so much fun. You just, you yep. find yourself in these situations that like Kenrith is the only commander that is going to get you out of these situations yep. and no mm-hmm. other Card advantage engine was going to do that for you. So Mm -hmm. I don't know. The flexibility of this commander and its consistency in the top 16s that we see it got me to the top 16 at the Cloud City event that I played at. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. can't say this deck is bad. It's a consistent number seven. Yeah. Yeah. Ian, what's your uh, number seven? (laughs) My number seven is Malcolm Timna. Malcolm Timna. it's really hard to argue with Malcolm Timna being a good deck right now. It is just like, oh, hey, you want a more lean version of Blue Farm that loses Dockside and Breach. Okay, you have Malcolm Timna. Congratulations. You thought hard about this. Uh, <laughs> now, it's just like one of the most underrated underdogs in the format. I think it's just like, it's not appealing for a lot of people, right? Because it's just sort it's of very the same toast. It's the most milk toast deck in the format for sure. It is like pure. Here's my card advantage. Here's my man advantage. I win with Oracle. Hey, like that's that's the deck, right? Malcolm Timnell. Malcolm Timnell looks you straight in the eyes when it fucks you. <laughs> Yo, I felt direct that. I've eye Malcolm contact. Timna, I've played enough Malcolm Timnell to feel that. I know exactly what that is. 
it is playing no games. I I really like the deck, but it feels like it just it just needs a little bit more of an of oomph sometimes. It needs to try some different I positions. Guess, I get why it's falling in your guys's listings now. Well, it's moving up, Ian's. Oh, moving up. Yeah. Ian's. So it was oh, it was ninth for Ian last month. Yeah, and now oh, sorry, it's seven. I wasn't paying attention. It I was, was thinking about was, something else. Well, it fell for me. It was six <laughs> last month, and it was you were thinking about. Uh, you, new, I was thinking about you. New Malcolm Timna positions. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Always thinking about new positions for them. <laughs> what? <laughs> but yeah, so Malcolm Timna at number seven. I have nothing more to say. Okay. What, what could I possibly say after all? <laughs> I, I didn't mean to derail you. <laughs> <laughs> what, what else could be important after any of that? Well... Do you want to try doggy or do you want to try oh like cowboy or like we're going to a cowboy set? Like we could try some new things. Oh like, God. <laughs> get, get me out of here. I need an adult. <laughs> Mom, please come pick me up. Uh, my number seven is Rogue Sai. It is up one spot. Uh, Rogue Sai. I've been, I've been, uh, listen, li- this is something that I, I, I gotta say because I have, goldfish this deck a ton and every time i goldfish it i have the exact same thought no wonder you fuckers have to mulligan down to like two fucking cards because your card quality is so shit like holy shit if my cards were just mana and only mana then yeah i'd probably mulligan down that far too like it it, it drives me insane to try like I, i i recognize why it's good and I recognize that it's very good and it does well in Zane Nair's hands. But like outside of that, like it is <laughs> what? I said doxed. Yeah. <laughs> it's on his fucking Twitter. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, like outside of that, like every time I've tried to play the deck, it, 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 I recognize it is not my style of deck. But mm-hmm. I also think that is important for rog side pilots to note number one i have you in my top 10 so chill two your deck just doesn't have high court card quality in it you are sacrificing card quality for speed all i am trying to get across is for rog side players to stop snuffing their fucking copium that their deck has high card quality oh right of flame is the best card Right of Flame's a bad card. I'm sorry. It, it's not good. It, it is objectively not a great card, but it gets you to a place that you need to go, and that's fine. That, 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 that's what your deck is, and your deck is good. It's very good at going fast. That's all I have to say about it. If you, if you want to play better cards, there are other Grixis decks out there, um, and you could also just play Blue Farm like an adult. Um, <laughs> number six cam well i'll have more to say about that um because it's actually a little bit higher on my list so i'll chime in with my okay, thoughts okay. a little later um number six is a deck that i don't completely understand and i never know what the <laughs> hell is going on um and i i always react way too late against this is to say weather light captain yeah. what the hell is this deck doing <laughs> nothing that i know anything about playing these Rakdos creatures and is it creatures that you never see anywhere and then all of a sudden uh, three minutes of fairy came into play out of nowhere what the hell I can't respond you're winning the game what is going on this deck is nuts and it doesn't make any sense and what do you it, mean you searched for Sakashima the imposter and now won right yeah it's <laughs> it's crazy yeah it's just if you want to play every single EDH deck play this deck and then you <laughs> you don't feel like you're missing out um <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah, know. I just fair. um it, it the deck doesn't make any sense to me, but it makes sense to a lot of people who uh play much differently than I do and in those hands this deck can be very very scary. Um can do a it's lot me. of things. Yeah, like like <laughs> Ian, I know Rebel has kicked my ass with this deck yeah. before. Um and it's not a deck that I can foresee myself piloting well at all, but it's definitely a deck that I've also played I'm always afraid of. Yeah, I love this deck. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a good one. Um I I've played it enough to also know I like I've sat in so many tournaments and Ian can attest to this because I've bitched about it. 
is where people will just throw games because they're like, oh, let the Sissy player get an activation off so that they can like deal with whatever's going on right now. And I'm like, guys, mm-hmm. the Sissy player is never going to activate an answer thing. They're always going to an- activate and win the fucking game. Don't yeah. let them activate the thing. And it's it's just every single time. I don't know like, about it's that, but I, I, I understand your point. <laughs> it, it is in the modern age. Sisse doesn't go to find silver bullets. Sisse goes to find wins. And it's a lot different than like giving someone an extra draw off Ristic study in the yeah. hopes that they get a counter spell. It's it's not the same. Yeah. No, it's not. In yeah. in I've I've I have lost in events to people being like, oh well, let's give them mana so that they can do X Y Z to try and answer what you're doing, and then the Sisse player wins because of that. And it's like I'm sitting there actively losing my mind because I'm like, hey. Mm-hmm maybe let's not just give the deck that wants to tutor chain a free tutor. Like it, <laughs> I don't know why that's a, a, a crazy thing to say, but uh, Ian, your number six for the month of October. Uh, my number six is Rogsai. Um It's obviously one of the powerful decks in the format, uh, but literally anyone that isn't Zane seems to really keep screwing it up. So <laughs> that's, that's really it i i like i can recognize the deck strength i've played it a bunch it also just like there are matchups where it's like yeah you went fourth three times in a row okay yep sucks to be you right like or uh, or matchups like i had a, at mox masters where you are going first but you're playing three stack decks and or yeah. three two stack decks and a control deck and all yeah. of them get you down to one life decide yeah. you are dying and then yeah. figure everything else from there because yeah, they, exactly. they know right. what they're doing. Yeah, it's super, super easy to disrupt the list, in my opinion, um, despite, you know, arguments about like pivoting to risk study and stuff like that. Um, I think people who uh, keep letting Zayn win are not respecting the deck enough, yeah. if I'm being honest, or for some reason him as a pilot, uh, but they keep doing it. So don't get me wrong, the deck's inherently extremely strong. Right? It gives you a lot of tools. Yeah. Um, but it's also, uh, you know, there are many pieces able to disrupt it. The problem is, right, and this is what I ran into all of the Invitational, was, like, it's just a deck you have to play respectfully against and not greed into it. But I literally was running into people just jamming greedy lines that clearly weren't going to work. And then, well, guess what? Rockside picks up those pieces faster. Than that, that 13 seconds we were talking about, they need two. <laughs> right? They need two of those seconds. So don't, don't let them have it. Right? Rockside is one of the, the best decks in the format at capitalizing on your mistakes. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, taking advantage of like windows that people give you too because especially really early on when people feel safe yeah Mm -hmm. yeah for sure uh my number six for the month is atraxa grand unifier moving up one spot uh not much has changed people yelled at you isn't it yeah for sure (laughs) Uh, that's why i moved it up one spot uh no atraxa actually had a slightly worse month than it did it was like the the best deck of September by like a big sizable margin and it backs a little, little bit down four spots. But I mean, with that being said, the backsliding was two top fours and six, two top six, six top 16s. So like mm-hmm. I've seen worse results. Um, yeah. <laughs> like it, it's got a 26% win percentage. Uh, mm-hmm. Like it's, really real well 25 and a half but uh, so if you round up it's 26 but you know it's 25 ish uh win percentage like it is a really solid deck that i think i i agree with you cam like i i don't understand why it does so well but it just kind of keeps doing well and i think it I, i i think if i can if i have like one thing to identify what it is is the deck is like functionally old thrash timna but with a wing con in the command zone and more advantage outlet in the 99 so it just like it's able to do that thing where we were talking about like turning the corner really fast right because you can take those openings of oh i have an opening to go for it here i have easy win con access in these great advantage colors and just all of a sudden i'm winning the game And so I think that's kind of what's going on. I still haven't figured out exactly what is happening with Atraxa and its success. 
because on paper it feels like it should not be doing this well but yeah. uh it then you actually look at at its paper results and it is doing that well so you know mm-hmm. there there's some disconnect there that like the traditional logic is not working somehow uh so perhaps what they were doing is great and is working great and i'm the one on crack so uh, I, I think part of it is because your commander is big so is so big and clunky it kind of forces you to play a little bit slower and the format has certainly slowed down like a, a ton recently mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so when you can play a little bit more of a slower game and try to win second or third instead of like being the first player to win yeah. i think it, it just kind of forces you to play better cedh that way and then mm-hmm. that way when you do get to the late game because your deck has allowed you to get to the late game you can just snope all the fuck off with a clone and like all yeah, kinds of other yeah. things that just piece together these big attracts of wins. So mm-hmm. um, I don't understand it. I don't understand it, but that's certainly a theme that I've seen with another deck I'm going to talk about very soon. So I think it could be something to explain for attracts yeah. doing well too. Yeah. yeah. It's, it is like at, at the end of the day, it is just a four color value pile, right? Like it yeah. really just does that. Right. And so there's a certain point where it's just like, okay, there's only so many, times that like oh look i played a smothering tithe and people drew much cards and it's like oh now i can play a big seven mana tracks and you're like oh no what how did they get there <laughs> like, yeah like, it's just, it's just, like, i don't know it does that all the time yeah you know so uh moving on number five we're moving into the top five here cam what top is your five. number five my number five is tivet my number five is Tivit. Yeah, it fell down a little bit in the actual standings for tournaments, but in the overall format, I don't know. I think this thing still has a lot of legs. I haven't mm-hmm. respected this properly in the past. Um, I know. I watched but, your show. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but after like we really sat there and evaluated it, and then you know, you, you remember that it's four of the five things that you're looking for in a CEDH yeah. commander, like this thing is just going to provide you value. And it's another one of these decks like Atraxa where it forces you to play a little bit slower, which in the meta right now forces you to play better and to not be the first player to win the game. You get to play all the best. You get to play all the best spells. There's only one bad card in your deck and arguably it's not even a very bad card. And even with the politics thing, you know, where people are respecting it even more. I mean, you can still pull out wins even if people are, you know, hard down on you. And that's just at the very least. That's just you can draw bitch. all day. And that's the <laughs> other thing too, right? Yeah, you can draw all day. I mean, there's stuff that you can do, and like once you realize that, um, you know, you 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 have to play against it correctly, and you have to make sure that you're voting for the correct things. It can certainly mm-hmm. not make it as scary as it maybe has been in the past. But that being said, yep. again. It's just a deck full of really powerful cards that are playing very well into the meta right now. Yeah. This thing is just going to win more games than you're going to think it's going to. Yeah. Uh, for you, Ian, your number five. Well, for number five, I have uh, Atraxa. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> we've already talked about it a good amount. Um, Atraxa is just once again value pile, right? People keep letting it take advantage of those those windows that we talked about right and in a good way to take care of advantage of a window is by going oh hey you you messed up your dock side win cool i'll play a clone mm-hmm. and then uh i'll draw 10 cards the equivalent of right or it's probably closer to seven or, or five you know uh and then oh yeah well, that's so weird i play another clone and i'm gonna draw another five to seven cards and wow uh, that's bizarre hey, so i just keep doing this the game's over uh, yeah <laughs> oh yeah let me do that guys all right Could you sack cloud <laughs> outlet and reanimate oh my god <laughs> yeah yeah it's i don't know it's it, it's it attracts as one of those cards i mean it literally uh I, I i think i literally played against you when i borrowed dylan's deck that one time mm-hmm. yeah when i was like i just sat there with a rustic study didn't play attracts the whole game i was just like i don't know like it, i got four good colors here <laughs> like, yeah right <laughs> i mean honestly like i think it is the it really has taken thras timna's like spot oh, in the dead. metagame absolutely and it, it, it fills sure. the exact same role that that deck played honestly mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um couldn't agree more my number five is also mm-hmm. tivit uh which is kind mm-hmm. of continuing to move down a little bit for me uh but yeah. overall in the standings it actually did have a better month than it did in september which uh yeah. is not a huge shift but it did move up a spot so congratulations tivit 
Um, <laughs> it is the best deck in the format at not losing. Uh, <laughs> per cap, <laughs> yeah, like, like per like like proportionally speaking it has the most draws of any deck and Mm -hmm. it is like really and i had this experience playing it is it's a very good deck at going for a win you get stopped and then you're like cool nobody else is winning now and it's just very good at doing that um yeah i i do think there's some new stuff that's coming out that's uh in this upcoming set that's going to help propel it forward a little bit uh, because I do think that there are some some pieces that it's going to be getting that uh, in some innovations that I'm going to be trying that I think will help kind of push the deck over the hill and kind of help convert like the uh, what's it the draws into wins. Uh, yeah. But overall, I, I love where the deck's at still. I just think it's performances. It's going down a little bit because people are kind of playing weird. And Mm -hmm. also, like, it's just like one of those decks where, like, it's not losing a lot of games. It's just drawing a lot of games. So Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. that's that's where it's at. uh, My my number five. Moving on up to number four. Uh, Cam, what do you have at number four? You're all wrong. This is where Rog Silas belongs on the list up here. Oh no. Yeah. I kind of have a, I kind of have a, it, it's funny that this is even a top 10 deck for you guys based on how you guys talk about it. It's, um, yeah. that's probably the meanest thing I'll say all day, but like, I, I don't know. Like I come kind of completely disagree with Callahan here. I think, I think Rog Sai is full of good oh, cards. You like and Rite like, of Flame. I Rite love Rite of Flame. Do you, you have you ever Rite cast a Rite of Flame when someone yeah, else fucking Flame that it makes you three mana? It's great. Oh my it's god! Just, three mana. It makes yes, it it's dark a red ritual. dark ritual. It's a red dark ritual. Sometimes that's awesome. What will I do? What infernal. Does lo- is, infernal. Is lotus petal ritual. a bad card? Do you cut lotus petal from like every deck? No, you don't. And in this deck, like it's it's freaking awesome. No, like, because my, deck, I'm sorry, because my other plays my other cards. rituals are fucking... plays a bad card. Magda plays bad cards. It doesn't Divot play the same bad amount card. of bad cards. There is zero bad cards in Rog There's zero Silas. bad it cards makes, in Rog Sai. It makes zero bad awesome cards. use out of all of them. And even the worst cards aren't like bad cards to begin with. They're like, at worst, medium to pretty good cards that it's making even better. As opposed to a Magda who's taking horrible cards and making them okay. Or a Atraxa who still has to play food chain cards in it, which blow. Here's so, our card quality. We're, we're going to talk card quality real quick. Let's talk card uh, quality. My, my, favorite, my favorite card of all time is so good, never a dead card, Simeon Spirit Guide. Let's get here. Yeah, never a dead Simeon card. Yeah, if, if, if you're trying to play uh, fast, also exactly up here, uh, Sorcery Staple. It's Warrior's Oath. Give it up. Is- Card is also Give great. Extra for, turn um, spells have proven to be very powerful in the format. Here, and so. don't forget everybody's favorite wheel, Wheel of Misfortune. Our, okay, so this one, I notoriously hate this card. However, <laughs> I have been swayed. Dylan has swayed me. This card is actually really good in Rogsai because it's a deck that doesn't care if the rest of the table wants to wheel at all. You are the only person that you care about. You play selfishly. You're the one that wants to wheel. It works better for you But I feel like there are better anyway. cards at doing that than wheel. There are, fortune. but when you need more, you got to resort to some of these other things that but, are but, still but, 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 fine, but, here's, but just here's not the thing, as Cam, good. Cam, I'm looking at Zane's list right here, right? I'm looking at a, a list that made a top, like won a tournament recently. Yep. It's running Time Twister, Wheel of Fortune, Wheel of Misfortune, Windfall. You're telling me the other options to replace Wheel of Misfortune that might be maybe one mana more but don't open you up to the issues that that card opens you up to are worse options than wheel of misfortune. Probably because all the other ones aren't actual card advantage or are too expensive. <laughs> this is the most circular logic statement <laughs> that went around. We did a whole lap to finish that sentence. Like, <laughs> <it's> like <laughs> Cal, Jesus listen, I don't know. I, I, I would, I would say like leaning the, into the, the meme. Okay. I like leaning <laughs> into the meme. Uh, I, I just I just like that the I just think that the card quality is a little bit higher than it, it, than it's not. Um there there's a lot of it, it's playing like all still like the, the best cards in 
the combination. It's one of the fastest decks that is in the format, which is still something that is very important here. And it can present mm -hmm. multiple wins. It does have resiliency under its belt. There are going to be games where you, you are going to get unlucky, but we could say that for any one of these decks where you're going to get unlucky. Yep. So I really don't want to weigh that against it. Um, so that being said, Rogsai is going to be very scary. It's going to be something that you got to respect. And I have it up there at number four. Yeah. And, and my, my, my to, to, to be fair, like I, I do concede your point. Like I am being extraordinarily hyperbolic. If that's not oh, yeah, clear. No, I know. <laughs> um, but like I, Callahan, what? No. <laughs> well, the thing is, is a lot of people seem to think I'm serious all the time. So, um, but no, I mean, like one thing to keep in mind with this deck that I think is like important is when I say that, like it, when I point out thing, it, like it struggles when it gets targeted down. It struggles in a way where like decks like Atraxa or Tivit or I mean, like. Najila even or Kinnon can dig themselves out of that a lot easier I feel like than Rog, Rog Sai can and I feel yeah. like that's because they have some form of advantage in the command zone where Rog Sai is trading that away for just pure speed and I think like I, I think that's where like Ian and I value that I, and I think that's just where you see like a difference in the values right where yeah. it's like Ian and I definitely value that ability to dig out a little bit more than maybe like you or Zane or like other people. Like, and I think that's valid and I don't think that that's an invalid like point of view for what it's worth. Like I, whenever I come on the show, I want to make sure that I'm being <laughs> fair to people while also being extremely hyperbolic and giving the hottest takes available. So, uh, <laughs> I also will say I think your your views on the archetype do not directly reflect my views Correct. on the archetype. I yes. think I think you're much more extreme when it comes to your perception. Well, and that's also more, that's also because I, I I if people have not picked up on this, it is kind of a bit. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> the more people play into the fact that I dislike this deck, the more it makes me want to play into the bit because people can't <laughs> figure out that it's a bit. So I'm saying it right now. And if nobody plays into me giving this deck a hard time from here on out, then I'll start rating it higher, I guess. But I like, <laughs> I think more than any other deck, this, this deck is ranked based on your play style. Kind of like what you were saying, yeah, Callahan. hundred percent. Like if you are, if you are typically a stacks player, I think you're going to look down on this deck a little bit more, but like if you are someone that tends to like turbo strategies, like this is something that you're going to rate super high. So I think it does make sense where we all have it in our list based on the yeah. kinds of players that we are, how much we respect it and where, um, I don't know. I, I just, that's what I think. It's much more, much more personal this one than any of the other decks that we're talking about. See, this is why we do it as a a panel like ESPN style power rankings where we all kind of have our opinions on it because it just kind of goes to show that there is not a definitive rankings of these things. It is all very contextual. It all really matters. Uh, yeah, it's nice to have more data now that we have more data available yeah. than like we did last year or the year before that. But it's still not like nearly enough data to actually know. No, it's still laughably small data. Points yeah, that we laugh, have. especially with um, the amount of new cards we always get. Like it's yeah. Well, also that like we we literally cannot record with any amount of certainty, like competency, and like yeah. that is an amazing statistic that is just missing from CEDH, right? And it's not just player competency, right? Like player skill is obviously a recorded metric. You can see people doing well with decks over and over again, right? But like, how can you record that the like, oh yeah, this person tapped out even though player B told them not to and threw them the game. And that yeah. happened to this player twice in one tournament. It's like, how do you record that in CEDH, right? Like player skill. Can you skill imagine if that's like, something that we had on EDH well, top 16 next to your name? Yeah, yeah. The punch. How, how literal errors, error numbers. Yeah. Error numbers yeah. And yeah. Like, <laughs> Well, I mean, honestly, and, and, oh my God, I would love to see some people's error counts. Oh, dude, don't oh, look at my error so history. Happy. Jesus well, Christ. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the things I've I, like, I, I wanted to implement uh, eventually. Like, if I ever have the resources I want to do the MLC yeah. the right way, like, that would be the yeah. thing where I would have a statistician sitting there and like tracking stuff like that, where we mm. can get, you know, like Major League Baseball or NFL like type stats so that you know, yeah. like, 
how are players it's also, playing and how are yeah. decks playing? Any it's correlation gauge, between like, when I stack someone... my deck and when I win the game? <laughs> yeah, it's easier to gauge someone throwing the ball wrong, though, than compared to like, ah, yes, in this nuanced stack of 13 spells, my opponents made a miscalculation, yeah. right? Like, that's... Yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. also always easier to see things when you're standing outside of the game than inside of the game, too. Yep. Hindsight's mm-hmm. always twenty twenty, so and something like that's yeah. tough. I don't know. 100%. And I think this is one of the most one of the most interesting factors of CEDH is like, and and I had this come up a lot in conversations with people who are like just outside observers mm-hmm. or people who like really like to think they one up you, intellectually speaking, uh, is that like. <clears throat> oftentimes like i'll explain to people like oh yeah like my opponents didn't listen to me and we lost and it's like oh yeah okay well it clearly worked because they didn't listen and you lost the game it's like no no no, you don't understand <laughs> we lost <laughs> me and person who refused to listen to me yeah. we lost the game right it's like it doesn't matter like player three just sat there didn't say anything maybe said one vaguely convincing thing and they won the game they weren't in the interaction where they refused to listen yeah. right <laughs> like yeah i mean i, I mean this is again by i compare it to survivor and why i bring up the social element so much and why i think people who Mm -hmm. are just like shut up and play is it's just like you are missing out on how to play the game correctly because Mm -hmm. quite honestly you can't just shut up and play because it's not an effective way of playing the game because it turns out your opponents are stupid um I use shut up and play as a way for me to stop listening to someone else who's trying to get me to say something or to do something yeah. in particular. Uh, it's a little trend we've started with Tyler a little bit more just because he is a he is very good at <laughs> twisting my knobs in a way that get me to do things that I don't want to do. So now um, we've got we've got Ian, we've got Tyler and we've got uh, sick robot are the, yeah. the inceptors. I'm going to make I'm going to get ready for the the AI face swap movie poster of inception with those three on it because yeah. it's coming uh, <laughs> uh number as as get to be Leonardo. <laughs> number four ian what do you got i have my girl sis saying she's she's doing the thing uh rocking it killing it yep killing the game i actually might switch my number three and number four to be honest uh i just think number three has had a good month um but i like mine four better uh, Sissé is just really strong. It keeps sneaking into top counts, and everyone's like, "I really don't even get how I lost, but I did." Uh, <laughs> and that just keeps happening. That was me. That was a direct quote of me. With voice, I don't know what happened. You, I was interviewed post game, and that's exactly what I sounded like. <laughs> it, it, it makes me think of that Chance the Rapper bit where he's just like, "Yeah, they were out there on the hockey." Let's do that hockey. Like, that's what it makes yeah, me yeah. think of. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, no, but I mean, it's just so strong. It's it's one of those decks that's like, if you don't, like, if you don't get your engine online, it, it looks like Sissé does literally jack all, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but when Sissé does get online and they get a couple activations going, you look down and you're like, wait, oh, that just wins? Oh, damn. <laughs> like, <laughs> Wish I knew that uh, 40 and- seconds ago. Yeah. 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 Wish I, realized, wish I knew that before i let that resolve <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly um and i've seen that interaction many 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 times yeah. so it's uh it is what it is this is strong and uh efficient and that's all she needs to be really yep. that's also my number four sissé uh moving down mm-hmm. two spots from number two last month um i i like sissé a lot very similar opinions uh hey by the way uh i said it earlier i'm gonna say it again stop giving them free fucking searches like just stop doing it like, I don't understand why we think that's okay, but it's not a risk. Cam, you put it perfectly. It's not a risk draw. Stop treating it like it's a risk draw. Uh, yeah, I think there's a little more nuance to no, it. No, there's sure. not. Think, Every no, that, that, I, You I say that because you're a sissy play. player. There's no Shut up and yes. play. Shut up and play. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like you're going to say this and people are going to do the Tibbet thing. They're going to do the Winota thing where they just like kill the commander and like don't ever let it happen. Yeah. It's like, okay, cool. And that's, and that's how King making scenarios yeah, yeah. happen, right? And it's like, it, it keeps happening where a deck does well for a little I'm, while. It happens to use the commander and everyone's like, oh, burn, burn their legs. I'm Never specifically let them saying, I'm not saying don't let them have the Sisse. I'm saying don't specifically give them two mana to search. This is very, very, very specific to me. Yeah, it's scenario. extremely specific and not applicable to our audience scenario. Good job. It, it's just, <laughs> I, I, I've seen it happen a couple of times where somebody is like, 
yeah, I'll give you a uh, mana to do this. And so you can search to find an answer to player B and, oh no, you won the game. And it's just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure. Oh no. <laughs> Don't do anything to give your opponents any resources. I didn't know that was a hot take, but don't, yeah. don't do anything like Welcome that. Welcome to the Mind whoa, Sculptors whoa. where really benign <laughs> things are hot takes. Uh, <laughs> moving on to number three, Kim. What do you have at number three? Oh, boy. Number three is Kinnon. Okay. Kinnon Bonder Prodigy. I think that's his title. Yeah. Correct. Um, yeah. Kinnon. Geez, what, what do I say about Kinnon that I've never said about Kinnon before? Kinnon, bondage um, guy. Yeah, bondage prodigy. He's really good at it. Um, <laughs> this is one of those times where I remind you that Kinnon is canonically a teenage boy, but thank you so much. <laughs> All right, strike that, uh, strike that last bit from the uh, the record there, and we're going we're gonna to move on. Just keep on, on moving. Um, yeah, no, Kinnon... Kinnon just does some busted stuff. Uh, Dylan uh, said on our podcast recently, it feels like Tron. Because even when you shut down Kinnon, it just gets yeah, enough yeah. mana sources and they can just mm-hmm. keep getting it uh, or keep getting their creatures. And then God damn it, it, now it I want to realize <laughs> it just made me realize yeah, like up. no wonder why I'm so freaking scared of it. Like it just feels like you're playing it's, against it's Tron. literally interactive Tron. Yeah, yeah which, is, sure. like, it's, it's, which is like only, only way that you could have the only way you could have made Tron scarier was to give it blue and give it like access to force of will and like a cheap commander uh-huh. that can make. You know, Mox yeah, yeah, yeah. Amber and Fierce Guardianship, super playable too. Yeah. Like gr- green sucks in my opinion in the format right now, but like blue is just good enough and the ability to double most of your mana rocks and like just have this insane multiplier on all of the mana that you're making all the time. Yeah. Like take a, take a look at that elf. What if there were two? Yeah, right? <laughs> like it's, it's not. What if, it's, what it's, if every it, elf was a color fixed soul ring <laughs> is a really good question. Right? Like, <laughs> It's and if, even with the presence of Orcish Bowmaster, like all of my deck, my Kenrith deck right now has like besides Esper Sentinel, care. yeah, Esper Sentinel and Lothar are the only two creatures that will die to Orcish Bowmaster besides my Bowmaster itself. Yep. And yeah, like you said, Kinnon does not care about Orcish Bowmaster. It's gonna have enough mm-hmm. rocks where it's gonna still be able to jam these humongous value pieces to completely stop the game from going anywhere. Yeah. It's like the only deck. One of the only decks that plays Void Winnerer successfully, which is just dumb. It plays Perplex- mm-hmm. Perplexing Chimera, or at least the version that I play against all the time, plays Homeward Path and Perplexing Chimera and Seedborn Views in it. 90% of the list except for mine. Dude. It's, yeah, so, for sure. <laughs> it's so gross. I mean, I'm, like any I, deck, you know, once you play against it enough, like you know what to do and like you can politic your opponents into using two removal spells to get rid of the Perplexing Chimera. However, mm-hmm. that's still really good for the Kinnon player. It doesn't matter if you have stacks. Kinnon's still going to be really good. I know I'm monopolizing all the things to say about Kinnon, but like no, I'm just, but I've just been afraid of this deck for years. I have two because I, I've had it in my uh, playgroup for a very long time. I really hate you for making the comparison to Tron because you, you activated the lizard brain of mine that <laughs> here's Tron in like any form of it's like Tron in this and my brain just goes oh I want to play that and because (laughs) I fucking love Tron so thank you Cam because now I'm going to be playing Kinnon because dude put it together that thing is just unstoppable you made a comparison that my brain was just like oh yes (laughs) obviously must do how do we build like (laughs) Tron yes let's do uh (laughs) Number three for you, Ian. What do you have here? Uh, once again, clarifying that it's only because it did really well this month. But we have Najila back on back on the top three. Uh, turn sideways, make warrior play. Uh, no, is deck good? I don't know. Like it's it's so boring. I'm so tired of talking about this fucking deck. But like, I guess it's here and it's doing well. It's here to stay. Uh, people people got the joke for a while and then they started killing warriors and they started not letting them have bowmaster stuff and then pilots started doing new cool things and then uh people were like oh what if we told the joke again and then for some reason it's working uh i don't i don't know najila is just like it's a five color pile it's got a lot of good cards in it turns out so it can only be so bad back, right <laughs> like, yeah huh uh if you think you're tired of talking about it think about somebody who has played against pongo and phoenix for literal years now 
And uh, that card has not left my field of view for any amount of time. And I hate it uh, since it has been released. Um, mm-hmm. My number three is Tim Necrom moving up two spots. Uh, Tim Necrom came roaring back after having a horrible September. It came back and had a great October, a huge mm-hmm. rebound, uh, two tournament wins, eight top fours, 22 top 16s, 22. That is a lot of top 16s in the month of, uh, what was it, October. And that was with 49 entries. So that's about a 45% conversion rate getting into top 16s with that deck. So it's putting up wicked numbers. And I still hold it at number three because I'm not going to fall into the, the swing again of the... T- the Timnacrom pendulum of, hey, it's really good. It's really good. It's really good. Oh, my God. It's the best deck. Oh, my gosh. People are playing weird. Oh, it's really bad. Keep doing what you're doing, guys. You're playing it correctly right now, evidently. So good job, Vam. You, you did something right. Whatever you're doing mm-hmm. right now, keep doing that and stop doing what you were doing before that. Um <laughs> Number two, it ain't broke. don't fix it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, can. Number two for you. My number two is Nijiela. Yeah, I don't know what it is about this deck, but this deck is just really good. Yes, I do. It can be cast with just Jeweled Lotus. That's bonkers. And then it just like snowballs from there. Holy hell, that's pretty nuts. Um, mm-hmm. For Trevor all the reasons- Nijiela, tell me something yeah, I haven't right? heard before. <laughs> for all the reasons why I like Kenrith being a five color commander, this is just a more efficient way to do five color. It's a faster way to do five color. And yeah. um, although it's, it's a little bit tougher to get in with Najila now, I think the more that it gets disrespected, the better it's just going to get. So if, yep. if, if mm-hmm. we rank it low and we don't think it's going to do too well, this deck's going to run It'll us over. And you, back. <laughs> yep. And you can't do that. You got to be, you got to be ready for pretty much every single deck. Every single deck you got to treat equally. And block this deck the is warrior. never not good. Yeah. Block Just warriors. block the warrior. Yeah. And if there's two in a pod, did you know that Najila can give the other Najila players warriors? That's disgusting. <laughs> Why would you ever want to do that? But you can. And just watch out for that, too. Well, I guess that is never going to come up. But uh, I saw it come up at the do. invitation or at the open. Or there were two Najila really? pilot. Yeah, there were two Najila pilots at the table, and they were feeding each other warriors and picking off the other two players. And yeah, I mean, just I making guess it they, a game between them, which I guess is a strategy. So. I guess if you have more card advantage engines than the other player, I guess that's okay. But I feel yeah, like I don't if know you, if I, I I don't know if how I, I I don't know that I'm willing to like endorse the efficacy of that like strategy but it is a strategy uh <laughs> i wouldn't give it to another player but i would certainly accept them from another player yeah exactly i don't know i don't even play like forbidden orchard because i don't want to give my opponents a one one that every single color can make use of no i don't want to do that why would i give you a call why would i give you a card i would give you a card to sect a culling ritual what the or culling the week what the fuck um mm-hmm. ian you're number two my number two, my top two decks here are two decks that I think just sort of stand above the rest of the format by a reasonable amount. Uh, number two being one that had an insanely good month, Tim Necrom, uh, we talked about multiple times. It's just four insane colors, uh, two insane advantage engines, not much really more to say. Uh, it plays stupid things. Uh, I still think every deck that's not playing three man to parry is playing Tim Necrom wrong. And that's my hot take, and I'm happy to move on from there. Yeah, <laughs> that's really yeah. it. Uh, my number two is Kinnon, Thunder Prodigy, moving down one spot from the number one spot. Uh, it had a pretty fine month. It was twenty five percent win percentage. Uh, also had uh two tournament wins, uh, several top fours, and somewhere around I think like twelve ish top sixteens. Um, if you count for Lotus Con data, so like it, it, it's still performing really well. I think the only reason I moved it down is because I did notice a notable shift at the Mox Masters event of people being very aware of it. Finally, and, oh my, yeah, like people God. were really respecting Kinnon. What'd you say? 
Didn't it also still make? No, it did not chop 16, uh, the invitational. It did at the open. Uh, uh, but okay. I, I did notice a very sizable amount of people were uh, respecting Kinnon more. And who? Hmm? The invitational, I think only Max played it, right? So no, Max was in the open or in the invitation. Invitational. Yeah, That's what he said. didn't top 16. Yeah. Right. I'm saying there's only one pilot, so I don't think that's well, exactly yeah, but in the, the open only one <laughs> made top 16 and I think there were like four pilots. So it was no, like, sure. yeah. um, which is like fine, but overall, like across the month, even you could see it pull back just a little bit. Um, and it's not like a huge pullback. Like it stays on the standings where it was last month, but you can see like it's win percentage fall. Um, mm-hmm. So like it is doing fine and it's still doing well i'm not saying it's worse i'm just sent noticing hey people are being a little bit more aware of it and so Mm -hmm. i i think that is a good thing and uh but i god that comparison to tron really got me horny (laughs) jesus christ (laughs) that made me feel a type of way number one all of a sudden (laughs) it it made me feel a type of way i gotta tell you uh and uh so number one for you cam is I got Tim the Crom Blue Farm up here at number Tim one. The Crom. And I don't know if there's really anything that is going to knock this thing down from its number one status in my mind for a, a, a long time. Like it's, it's the best two card ad- advantage engines in the format. And I think outside of player skill, it's definitely the best deck in the format. And what mm-hmm. holds it back in some people's hands might be player skill, might just be some unfamiliarity with it. But it's certainly a deck that the more that you play, the more rewarded you are for knowing some of the lines, remembering that you can't consultation with Esper Sentinel in play sometimes. <laughs> like uh, there's just um, like weird, weird little nuances that come up with the deck like that. But uh, it, again, it's, it's another one of these decks that plays zero bad cards and it's always going to be the scariest thing at the table for me. Um, Blue Farm, definitely number one in CEDH for me. Yeah, I love Blue Farm, uh, especially right now. Uh, number one for you, Ian. Get in. Get in. Um, yeah, it's like, I don't know. I don't, it's not even close for me. Uh, it's playing with Blue Farm in, uh, I guess, the end of last month felt like I was given a sword in my hand against a field of people with knives. Um, and then I played Kinnon at Lotus Con and it felt like they handed me a pistol. <laughs> 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 and it's just i don't know it's i love canon i think it's it is one of those decks with an insanely high ceiling and a very low floor uh and you see that with the results of these players right so that's why like i didn't really blink when you said one person made top 16 and then the others didn't even come close right and i'm like yeah because that's how canon will work and has worked until the end yeah. of time and for me it's this ranking always ends up being more like what do i see the best players being able to bring to a tournament and do well with, right? So for me, that's the answer of Kinnon, right? Is like I the people, good players who are very comfortable with the deck will show up and execute an entire tournament by playing that deck. Now, you can argue that like Blue Farm is better in the hands of the masses, and it's you know, you can give a random chuckle fuck off the street Blue Farm, and they're gonna do better than they will with Kinnon. And I completely agree. I think that's why they're number two. And I think that's why my conversation goes, I think these two are, are considerably above the rest, right? Um, but I think Kinnon's recastability, its ability to uh, have the speed of Rogsai with the efficiency and consistency of having an activated ability in the command zone on top of being an outlet, um, making up for the fact that it's only in two colors by the, the benefits that were just listed, right? Uh, the ability to play Haymakers that, once again, like we were talking about the Tron thing, right? You know, times I've been like, okay, I'm completely locked out of kin and stuff. There's graph diggers. Mm-hmm. I'm going to hard cast concentrated sphinx. The fuck y'all going to do? Right? I mean, <laughs> like, game. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Like I went from, oh no, I'm locked out to, oh, no. okay, cool. I win. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's really in, in it, a wild deck. Um, it, it had mm-hmm. one of the better performances of the month, uh, but uh, I moved it down simply because my number one had the best performance of the month. And that was Najila the Blade Blossom. It took down the most major tournaments of the month. Uh, And overall, I think that Najila just like does what I want a deck to do the best. 
and it kind of came back and like it, it felt like we sent it away because it got like we were like hey go figure out that um like if you ever watch like uh hell's kitchen right uh he'll, sometimes he'll send food back and he'll be like hey you need to refire this you need to do this bet different or whatever and he sent him back to the kitchen we sent the Najila players back to the kitchen we said hey figure out the bowmaster problem and they came back and they're like yes chef here you go and uh the deck just doesn't mind and it just I, I, I like Najila a lot. Is Najila, Kinnan, and Tina, Timna Krom, like honestly, the two decks, if I were to sleeve one up right now that I feel like the most uh, that I could just play tomorrow is Najila. I've played it a lot. I've played against it a lot. And I'm uh, so surprised by this decision <laughs> and your analysis in this moment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> who, who could have called this? <laughs> not like a deck that you've always leaned towards or anything yeah like that. i mean like yeah. najila is a deck that i like i i have such a love-hate relationship with i hate it at the same time i can't quit you what <laughs> i said i can't quit you i mean honestly it, it it's you know it's like the, the that bad boyfriend that i just can't beat um you know the the sex is amazing and uh <laughs> But yeah, Najila is wow. my number one. So uh, just to recap here for you, uh, the honorable mentions for the honorable M from Play to Win was mm-hmm. Rocco Cabaretti Caterer with number 10 being Magda, nine being Thrasios Bruce, eight being Atraxa Grand Unifier, seven being Kenrith, six, Sisse Weatherlight Captain, uh, five was Tivit Seller of Secrets, four, Rogsai, three, Kinnan, Two Najila, one Timna Krom, and then for the lowly, 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 lowly Ian, for my my <laughs> my Nad Pod friends out there. Uh, honorable mention yeah. of the month was Varagoth Blood Sky Sire. Number ten Talion. Number nine Tevish plus whatever. Eight Tevit Seller of Secrets. Seven Malcolm Timna. Six Rogsai. Five Atraxa. Four Sisse. Three Najila, two Tim Nakrom, and one Kinnan. And then for the esteemed Callahan, the mind sculptor. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> my honorable mention for the month was Malcolm Kettis. And my number 10 was also Talion. Number nine was Malcolm Timna. Number eight, Dargo Thrasios. Seven, Rogsai. Six, Atraxa. Five, Tivit. Four, Sisse. Three, Tim Nakrom. Two, Kinnan. And one, Najila. Thank you, Cam, for joining us this week. Thank you I for really having me. This was yeah. great. It was awesome. Uh, we finally have had you onto the podcast, and it was not a fuck around. Well, we fucked around, but it was not a a joke episode. <laughs> Exclusively. Yeah. yeah, yeah yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad we made this work. <laughs> yeah. For people who are not familiar, for the like handful of people who don't know who play to win, it, what, let them know where they can find you, what your channel is, and all about that. Uh, yeah, check out Play to Win MTG for CEDH gameplay and podcast episodes every single week. We got some new stuff coming up uh, for 2024 that we're very excited for. That's next year, right? Yep. Um, yep that's, so that's how years work. <laughs> yep. So you can find us everywhere at uh, Play to Win MTG. Uh, Ooh. Ian, coaching the, the Ian coach. Yeah. Ian, put Hello, coaches, everybody. Put your coach's hat on. We're going to the coach's corner. <laughs> Yes, let's see. What's my coach's hat today? These these bent up microphones. Hello, uh, it is professional CEDH coach Ian. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. You can find me over at youtube.com slash comedian MPG for any sort of tournament CEDH stuff, mostly top 16 breakdowns. Um, and if you're interested in CEDH coaching from the player with the most wins with diverse decks over the past two years, I'm pretty sure. Uh, it's a pretty good accolade. Uh, come, come check it out. You can hit me up on Twitter, Discord, or email at comedian MPG. At gmail.com. You could just be making up accolades at this point. I could. I could. Yeah. I could. Yeah. <laughs> and yet. Uh, I'm the best player the, on this side of the Milky Way. <laughs> the the more the Lord Buttfart 69, the first of his name. Uh, yes, that is correct. <laughs> also, while you're at it, uh, don't forget to check out the Mind Sculptors Patreon, which we will be revamping. Uh, we will be reintroducing the uh, this is a thing that I can 
probably safely announce is we were going to be reintroducing Brewer's Choice. And so, uh, again, Ooh. we are going to, for our patrons, we're going to offer you guys a uh, choice of four decks, let you guys vote on it. And then we're going to brew those decks here on the channel. And you'll get to see what Ian and I come up with for different decks that are going on. Maybe we'll have some gas and it'll be fun. Yeah, who knows? We're going to have some gas. We'll, we'll, well, well, I yeah, always gonna, have gas. Yeah, that's true. That's that's my secret cap. I have IBS. <laughs> <laughs> I turned 29 and then my fart stopped being normal. They started being yeah. stinky. Uh, I don't know what happened, but something did mm. change. Mine are uh, alive now. Mine have a life of their own. Uh, if you want to follow us, you can follow us at Sculpty Boys, B-O-I-S on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Also, make sure to follow us on the Twitters uh, individually at Callahan is here and Comedian MTG. And uh, while you're at it, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button helps out the algorithm. And uh, how do you want to exit this episode, Ian? How do you think we should end this one? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, Cam, why don't we, why don't we get something from you? Why don't you just throw, just throw out some sauce? Just, just, just hit us. Just throw with it. something we'll, at we'll the spin. wall, and we'll see what we got. Throw something at the wall. Mm. Hit us with that Cam sauce. Yo, I need a new CDH deck to build. I only have Kenrith and okay. um, and that other one, Nimrus, together. What should I, what should I put okay. together next? Okay, what are you, what are you trying to do with it? It's trying to be good. You trying to be full deep in the spice? Um, what are you, what are you? Uh, I think spice is always interesting. I'm thinking about Thada yeah, yeah, yeah. Adele more. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. that one does feel like a trap to me. I'm not gonna lie. No, no, I um, and I've been entangled in a few in my day, so I don't be don't forget if... Arden Crumb, baby. Uh, oh my god, uh, All right. All right, that's Cam, okay. Here, Thank you, though. Have, Cam. You, <laughs> <laughs> have you seen LJ's top 16 list from the Invitational? Um, I don't think I have yet. No, okay. oh, it's it's I'm just gonna leave you with the nugget of like, go check that one out. Okay, it's it's, it's one of the weirdest decks I've ever seen, and I love it's a it. pile of cards. <laughs> That'll make you do things. It, I, I can't guarantee yeah. that it will be good things, but it'll make you do things. It'll make you do things. <laughs> I yeah, love sure. piles of cards that make me do things. So, <laughs> <laughs> especially mono blue piles that make absolutely no sense. If it's one of oh, those, yeah. I will love it. Oh, perfect! You should play Fibble Fib. That's you what you should play. Do. Yo, Proteus Dap Fibble Fibble Fib. <laughs> yeah. That's like the hardest thing in Matt outside of Black Cleave Cliffs. That's like the hardest thing in yeah. Magic to say. Yeah, yeah, fibble, 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 Nah, but this one is too. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This is the Mind Sculptors. I'm Cal. I'm also here. And we'll see you next time. <laughs> I'm over here. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>